Let's paint a scenario. You're good with your hands, you've got a good eye for detail, you love working with wood, and you found a really good niche market making fitted furniture for individuals, for their houses. This seems to really suit your skill set, you enjoy it, you think you can maybe make a business from this. Perhaps you've plunged in and this is your sole source of income now, or you are building this up alongside other work. The big question is how do you price this so that people want to pay the price that you set and that it actually makes you a living? This is a real challenge because the fact is bespoke, bespoke furniture is not cheap, it can't be cheap. And it may be a shock to you as the maker quite how much it has to cost. So you're trying to figure this out. Now let me give you a few pointers. What I'm going to do is first to go through the facts of what you need to figure out to, to price your work. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit about long term how you systemize the whole process so that things become more efficient and then I'm going to talk about a few anecdotes from our experience with reference to bigger furniture companies and what they charge. So to start with you've got to figure out what things really cost so that you're not just guessing or second guessing yourself and doubting the, the price that you've come up with because you will feel on the back foot very often especially as you start out with customers who say oh that's far too expensive or even say oh well I've got a much cheaper quote and you suddenly feel like you don't know what you're talking about. You are, you are the expert because you know the cost you just got to make sure that you've really gone into the details so you feel on solid ground in saying no it really does cost this much. So how do you start? First thing is you've got to set what do you want to earn per year. Let's say 30,000. I think that's quite reasonable for someone that's skilled as a maker, as a designer, as a business owner. Um, that's a very fair starting point, it seems to me. So £30,000 per year, break that down per month. And then I'm not going to give you all the details. I suggest you make a spreadsheet. If you want to, you can email me. I'll send you mine. But I would suggest that it's good to work it out for yourself. So break down per month what you want to earn and then look at the hours that you can work per month. So let's say 40 hours per week times that to make it the monthly figure. In reality, running a small business, building a business, you'll probably have to work more than that. But let's aim at what's a reasonable work-life balance, because that's only fair. Then you've got to say, well, what are my chargeable hours per week? That means the hours that you work that you can actually charge out to a, to a customer. You will have a lot of hours that are necessary to running the business that you can't charge out. So that'll be uh, balancing your books, sweeping the workshop, um, going out and, and buying a tool or, or getting a blade sharpened. There's any number of things that when you think about it, you can't actually charge. And that includes the surveys and quotes that you do that you don't actually win the work for because you can't charge for them, certainly not when you're starting out. So you may then find that your chargeable hours are somewhere between half and three quarters of your actual working hours. It may vary for you. So then you've got, to, you've got to divide your monthly desired income by your realistic chargeable hours. And that may come to something like £30 an hour. Then what you've got to look at is what are your overheads. And it's very tempting when you're pricing stuff and figuring these things out to be almost willfully blind to things because the figures start going up and you think, oh, well, I can't charge that. And you just sort of blindly hope that you'll make enough. You've got to get clear on the figures. So on top of your hourly rate, um, you've got to find out what are your overheads in total, which would be rents and, and rates for your premises. And even if it's in, on your own property, think about what it's really costing you to run that small garage workshop. Then you've got your, uh, your, your tool costs. So every month you may need to buy the odd new tool or, or bits or sharpening blades. Um, marketing, you're gonna probably need to start paying something out to, to market the business. For me, the stage the business is at, we've got admin help, so there's, there's a staffing cost there and other costs, memberships of organizations, um, things to do with compliance and health and safety. There's all sorts of costs and they will only inc increase as the business grows. So for us, I worked out that I need to be charging around about 15 pounds per chargeable hour to just to cover the overheads. It'll probably be lower when you're just starting out. So already we're looking at maybe £45 and upwards per hour that you need to charge out. And you've got to keep in mind that's really just the break-even figure. None of that is really profit, although you're, it seems to be much above 
what you think you need per hour, it's just covering all the costs of really keeping things running. I don't know if I mentioned uh, holiday time as well, you've got to have taken off your holiday time uh, from your, your monthly hours that you expect to be able to work. So then you're pricing up your jobs. It does make some sense to think in terms of days and half days. It can be a bit overly laborious to try and price everything to the, to the hour because in effect you, you really want to be allocating a half day to any task because if it's like a quarter day often you can't really get much else done then anyway. So you may want to break it down that way. And when you're pricing a job, you've got to look then at the preliminaries, which is going to see the customer, surveying the space, preparing the design, perhaps emailing back and forth, and then working out your cutting lists. All this does have to be paid for. It's only fair to be paid for your work. Then there's the making, the painting, the installation, the cleaning up. So think in real detail about how long it's really going to take to produce this work. And don't worry that there are people out there doing it faster, cheaper, because they're probably offering a very different service. And early on, you'll feel, you'll be made to feel too expensive when people are comparing you to someone that turns up, cuts a bunch of stuff out of MDF, makes a load of dust in the house, doesn't sand the edges of the MDF, maybe isn't even including the painting. So it's, you've got to compare apples to apples. You will be compared to people that are doing a completely different thing, offering a completely different service, and you just have to grow in confidence in, in saying, well, no, what I'm doing is actually quite different. And you'll start to find the customers that understand that and are looking for that. And that's key, that you find your appropriate customer base and don't feel bullied by customers that aren't the sort of customers that are really looking for what you offer. So let me just have a little check of my, my list. So we've talked about hourly rates, including overheads, finding the right customers, profit. So on top of the labor that we're working out, you need to add your material costs, and it's normal to add profit onto that. Often people will double the material costs. I've got to be honest, with where I'm at running my business, what, eight or nine years down the line, I do all my pricing the way I've just said, and it comes to a figure plus VAT now, so that's 20% extra for the prices I've got to charge. And I'm struggling to really add any profit on. And I'm sort of relying on us having increased the efficiency so my figures are a bit out of date and there actually is profit hidden in there. But it's not easy. It's not easy to get profit in there. And I still need to up my rates, really. And you have to constantly be, be growing your reputation to the point where you can then charge more. And that's fair and that's right, because um, it, it does cost what it costs. You've got to make a living at the end of the day. So I said I'd talk then about systemizing. As you've started to establish yourself and, and charge fair rates, you ultimately need to break free of exchanging your time for money. Because if you don't do that, you're not really running a business. You've just got a very demanding job. You need to systemize things so that things that used to take you two days maybe now take one day, but you don't charge one day where you used to charge two days because the customer's getting a better service. You do it so well, so efficiently, so without risk of mistakes, that the customer gets it finished quicker, everyone's happy. It's not fair for you to charge less because then you're devaluing all of the mistakes that you made to that point to get to that level of skill. The way that we've done that is we've got a particular line of work, which is our fitted alcove projects, which we have set a price per cupboard, per shelf, etc., on top of a base rate, which covers the fixed costs of surveying, designing, cleaning up, etc. And now the whole process of pricing is a lot quicker. We whittle out the customers who it's out of their price range because we can send them the price list before I even waste my time going to see people. I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm not saying waste my time with people. I just mean I, I need to get paid for my work. I'm still not making a ton of money from it. <coughs> so yeah, once you systemize processes and it's predictable because you know you always make doors in a certain way, you've timed how long it takes, you can set a price that you know is profitable and fair and you can just speed up and speed up and keep charging that price. So you'll find your own way of doing that. Some people become more standardized. I mean, most of, most of the big fitted furniture companies, I would say, 
are pretty canny and really only use one type of draw runner, one type of hinge, one draw length, uh, a fairly standard range of door sizes with big filler panels and and they charge a high price and just keep it easy and minimize mistakes because that's significant you'll have already found if you've been doing this for a little while already that it's very easy to make mistakes when every project is different and you need to stop beating yourself up about that and thinking everybody else doesn't do that because we all do and you either standardize so that you know that the unit's either going to be i don't know 40, 50 or 60 centimetres wide and you can't mismatch the door size or whatever um, or you just or you systemise to a level of detail where everything you kind of know what to do in a certain situation and that's very difficult and very time consuming especially as you build a team that you have to teach in doing this process just as an aside to that I strongly recommend reading a book called The E-Myth by Michael E. Gerber I'll put it in the notes below which is all about systemizing a small business and the, the difficulty of doing that, but the way that you can do that. So let me just talk a little bit about rules of thumb. So we've looked at a fairly detailed way to price things. What I like to do is to then cross-check that against rules of thumb, which are a mixture of what I've picked up from others in the industry and my own analysis of jobs that I've completed when I've gone back then to say, well, how many hours did it actually take versus my quote, because I'll always do a fixed quote and stick to that. How many hours did it, did it really take? Usually more than I thought. How much material did it really cost? And then I've reassessed the price with some profit. And then I've started to break that down per linear meter. So particularly for large units, fitted bookcases or wardrobes, these kind of, these kind of rules of thumb can be quite helpful. And to get straight to the point, a good industry standard is a thousand pounds per linear meter and upwards. That's a fairly base rate, really. I mean, I was hearing that a few years ago. I remember going into a showroom of, of Sharps and talking to uh, the salesperson there and just saying, well, do you have a, a rough ballpark price? And they said that. That generally is before that. So I've certainly spoken to other small furniture makers that are, that are charging 1200 pounds per linear meter. Um, <clears throat> for me, I'm finding that I usually need to charge more than that when there's a lot of drawers involved or other very bespoke factors, and certainly more than that for oak. So a few, a few anecdotes about pricing. I'll put some links to the projects that I'm talking about here so you can go dig and look them up. I mentioned oak just then. Um, I was working on this thousand pound per linear meter rule of thumb. I got one of my first large scale solid oak projects and I priced it up, I was keen to win it. It came to seven grand, which was a lot for the jobs I was doing at that time, and I was worried it was too much for the customer. We produced this whole thing. It, there was some profit in it. I think probably there was less profit in it than the standardized white painted MDF stuff. This is what I often find, because the more compl complex stuff takes so much more time than you expect, and the materials cost more. So I finished this job, charged seven grand, asked the customer, just out of interest, did you get any other quotes at the quoting stage and what were they? And he said, I had three other quotes. All of them were around about 10 grand. And he went for me because I was the cheapest. And also he said, because he really liked the way I designed and everything. So it was a no brainer at the price I was charging. That was a wake up call for me because clearly the market rate for that sort of work was three grand more than, than what I was charging. So I then took that that as a, as a revised rule of thumb, I, di I divided the 10 grand by the, the total linear meters, that's measured horizontally, total linear meters of that particular project. And then more recently, another large scale oak project came in, uh, someone quite far away from me geographically. I didn't want to go visit them and do lots of design and then price it and not get the job. So I said, well, it's gonna be about this much. And that was working out, out as, as an initial quote of about 12 grand. Um, just based on that linear meterage and um, she didn't really bat an eyelid at that in fact she quite clearly indicated that she'd had a far higher quote from Neville Johnson and she liked going with a small company with personal service I saw that that project through there's a detailed video of that that I'll post it's the Tudor Oak job with the the lighting integrated into it and the final bill for that was, if I remember rightly, about 15 grand because we added lighting and other features. 
And I think she said Neville Johnson were over 20 grand, but she didn't feel she would get quite the personal service. So all these kind of things, when you have these experiences, it's a real confidence boost that what you're charging, or what you should be charging, is fair. Because as a small provider, you're very often offering something that customers value more than the big providers who charge more and have bigger overheads, so they have to charge more. Another little example, there was a very tricky attic job where this, this couple wanted lots of storage drawers for craft items and things like that, and it was going into the slope of the eaves in their attic. So all the drawers, to maximize the space, you had very deep drawers at the bottom, I think 70 to 80 centimeter deep, going up to smaller drawers in, in the top of the slope and other quite bespoke features. And I, I priced this up and it was coming to just under seven grand. And it wasn't a very large job. It was certainly considerably smaller than a seven metre run. And I really thought that's too much. I, I was surprised it came to that much money, but I, I kept going through the figures. That's just what it was coming to with these big full extension runners and that sort of thing. I put the price in and, and they went ahead with it. And again, we finished the job and I said, well, did you get any other quotes? And they said, yes, we had Sharps come and quote. And the first, and this is a story I hear very often. So their first experience of the salesperson, and I'm not trying to get at Sharps, but this is just what I've heard. So the salesman came in and they were, the customer was keen to get up to the attic and show them the space. But the salesman wanted to sit them down in the living room and give them all the spiel about how great they are and how they can design anything and that it makes your house better, higher value, all that sort of thing. Um, eventually they managed to drag him upstairs and say, well, here's the space. And then he looked at it and was a bit stumped. And he said, ah, oh, okay, well, you can only get drawer runners 45 centimeters deep. So we'll just have to have a bank of drawers like that with some space behind. And then over here where you wanted a bit of a sliding wardrobe, again, wardrobes only come 60 centimeters deep. So we can't really make use of that deep space. And the customers were thinking, well, this is meant to be bespoke furniture. Surely something better is possible. Um, but they, they proceeded to get the quote from the guy and it was, it was somewhat over seven grand. So then when I came in and really designed what they were looking for, genuinely bespoke, well thought through, and it came a little under seven grand, it was a no brainer again, because I was cheaper and offering them more what they wanted. So again, that was a, that was a confidence boost that the, these kind of prices, which do sound high, are fair. I think one final more standard project, I did a series of um, three, three triple wardrobes. I've got a video on this on YouTube, which I'll, again I'll link to. Um, they were white painted, shaker style, nothing crazy or particularly non-standard. The customer again had got sharps in. Um, I don't remember the total price sharps had quoted, but their experience of the company was that um, the salesman had, had come in and been, been very heavy on the sales tactics, which is common a, a price will be set which is very high and then these companies will come down if you don't go ahead straight away they'll come down to around about the ballpark a thousand pound per linear meter plus VAT. that's usually what they come down to which is often where I'm roughly going in at for a standard job and they just found the salesman very pushy um, I think he, he came back twice and then they said well we're really not that happy about what you're offering and the price and the whole process and he stormed out uh, but had left his shoes somehow <laughs> uh, I think he's had shoe covers on and had to come back very sheepishly later to get his shoes uh, so I mean just customer service wise I think as a small provider you've got to remember you are really offering something quite special if you're a genuine person you're not using all these these sales tactics you're not you're not a salesperson who's getting paid commission and, and has to win that that job I mean yes you do but you're more invested in it you're able to genuinely answer the questions the customer has uh, genuinely say what's possible and what's not and as you your experience grows designing and making and fitting you you can't help but project competence and um, there's a name for it it's called consultative selling it's not your typical salesy stuff. It's genuinely knowing what you're talking about. And customers, customers love that. So it will be a long process building up the confidence and the experience. But I hope this video has given you a bit of confidence that you're not doing too bad 
even if things seem expensive and you're still getting customers who expect to pay IKEA prices, you will just have to build up to the point where the right sort of customers are, are finding you and seeking you out. And you'll make mistakes along the way. Those mistakes are what will enable you to do things really well in the future because there's no better teacher than a mistake. I think that's about everything I wanted to share. I do hope that's been helpful. I'm sorry there's not been a lot of uh, images to look at. I wanted to say the thing that prompted me to, to post this video was um, an email I received from Jamie who's just subscribed. I hope you don't mind me answering in this way, Jamie. I just know it will be helpful to others. And I also wanted to post in this way because I've been a bit quiet on here recently. I'm just on a family holiday. My wife's from California, so um, I'm, I'm not trying to give the impression that I'm a jet setter. Um, we just are lucky enough to have family here. So that's why I'm here. That's why I've not been posting my usual videos of making stuff. The team is back in England manufacturing a few things because uh, we've managed to systemize stuff to the point where I can to some extent just walk away although we, we are taking a bit of a financial hit. Anyway, I'm rambling now. This isn't on topic, but uh, thanks for watching and do feel free to ask me any questions and do drop me an email. Uh, Jamie found my email, I don't know if it's just by hunting through my website, freebirdinteriors.co.uk. Do drop me an email. I don't mind sending you some of the Excel spreadsheets I've worked out, but the deal will be that I'll put you on a, a mailing list if, if you contact me this way, you'll be on my mailing list. I'm not going to pester you, but I'm, I'm building up to the point where I'm going to start offering SketchUp training to people who are interested. So I hope that will be of value to you, and I'll just maybe drop you an email when I get started with that, and you can always unsubscribe. So, uh, yeah, do get in touch, and again, thank you for watching.